Hey there, digital world. Welcome back. I hope you all uh, are doing good on this lovely mid-November uh, day. I don't know where you are in the world if you're listening. If it's sunny, I hope it's nice. And if it's rainy, I hope that it's uh, not too terrible. At the moment, the world is collapsing in on itself. So being hot could be good or bad. Being cold could be good or bad. Uh, and on that depressing note, welcome back to another episode of Spliced In Later. As promised, I'm back for an episode on my usual day. Uh, this will be a short one, I think, because uh, this is more a a pondering a question I'm putting out there to the world, to the to the listeners, just to gauge how people feel about uh, this certain topic and whether it's helped them or hindered them in their quest to discover good movies out there in 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 the film world uh but i will be back i think later this week because of the review that i'm going to be giving for disenchanted the long-awaited sequel to disney cult hit enchanted starring amy adams uh it is dropping exclusively on disney plus i believe it's coming out on the 18th which is a friday meaning i'll watch it and then depending on what i do will be how quick I review it and put that up to you. Who knows? I could go either way. Uh, but also, I don't know if it's coming out this week. Um, originally, it was set for the 24th, and then I read somewhere that it was being pushed up to the 18th, and it is being pushed up to the 18th. But I'm not sure if that's consistent across all countries. Some countries may get it this week, some may not get it till next week. My Disney Plus seems to think it is coming this week, so we'll see. I don't know for certain. There's a couple of movies to, that are coming that are going to round out my contenders before I give you my top 10 films of 2022. A couple of them are on streaming. And again, those movies are not quite sure when they're coming out either. Glass Onion, the long-awaited Knives Out sequel, uh, is hitting Netflix in Christmas, Christmas uh, week. But uh, I'm going to go see it for an exclusive one-week screening next week in the cinemas. Same for Matilda the Musical. There's some exclusive screenings of it in the cinemas. Uh, but depending on who you talk to, either that's coming out on Netflix on the 9th of December or on Christmas Day. I don't know. Uh, so it could be all over the place. There could be times where I say, oh, I'm coming back for a regular episode and then I don't do it. But then to supplement it, I review three other movies. Um, it's going to be a, a hot race to the finish to see if any movie can upset the two greatest movies I've seen this year, which are currently fighting each other for the number one spot. I still don't really know which one's going to come out on top. Uh, I won't tell you what they are. You'll just have to listen in later and be surprised. But for today's episode, for our, our, little, our little musing, I just wanted to put it out there, the concept of remakes, but not just remakes in general that we get, like remakes of... Uh, uh, classic 80s and 70s films that remaking The Thing, for example, uh, or remaking Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles over and over again, that sort of thing. Uh, what I'm talking about are remakes between countries. So a movie that is uh, very popular, very well received, very powerful, very entertaining movie that's released in, say, France. And then America will release their own version of that movie, English-speaking language. They'll uh, cast their own actors, they'll change up the, the script a bit, they'll change the mannerisms to fit the culture of their country. And then whether or not that movie is a success or not kind of depends on a psychological level if people know it's a remake or not. Um, or if uh, there's just that need to get something that's like that film that your friend keeps recommending you to see but you can't watch because of the subtitles. Uh, so our main example that we're going to do today, and I'm picking this one because I can add it to my playlist for the top 100 bucket list movies. So I have my poster, I've mentioned this before, it was one of my ultimate achievements was going through and acquiring every film that was on that poster, watching it, and then getting to scratch off the little thing to see the little symbol underneath. It was like the lottery for movies, except I won. So it's, it's quite different from the lottery then. Uh, one of those movies was The Intouchables, a French movie. Now, I'm going to apologize in advance. I won't be naming all the actors in it because, one, I don't know them because I'm not familiar with French actors, and two, I'll probably mispronounce their names, which I don't like doing. I don't like saying someone's name wrong. The only one I can say for certain is Omar Sy, but that's only because Omar Sy has got involved with the big Hollywood 
franchises that I'm very familiar with. For instance, he was Bishop in the X-Men movies, or he was that guy Barry in Jurassic World, I guess. Uh, so yeah, he, he, he's also been in Inferno with Tom Hanks, the Robert Langdon movies. So he's been around enough that I can confidently say, I know who that is. Anybody else? No idea. Omar Sy's co-lead, I'm sure, is even bigger in France than Omar Sy is. But that's just the way of it. On my poster, there's quite a few uh, films that are from other countries. I've mentioned them before in passing. The Seven Samurai, City of God, uh, Emily, Old Boy. Uh, maybe in terms of uh, popularity or well-knownness, aside from Old Boy and Seven Samurai, The Untouchables is pretty much up there as being well-known for most countries. It's, it's, it's breached that barrier of, of different films in different languages to become mainstream, well-known to all people. And The Untouchables is probably the highest grossing of all these movies as well. Indeed, I was aware of the film. I hadn't seen it, but it came out in 2011. And I was at university at the time and it made the rounds. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was recommending it. As a university that likes to be artsy-fartsy or whatever, uh, they were putting up the Untouchable poster everywhere and advising of special screenings in the library or whatever to really enhance your mind for that that French movie, whatever. Uh, I did the easiest thing I could do and just told people I'd seen it when I hadn't, just so people would leave me alone. But it's on the poster, so I had to watch it. So I went down and bought it on DVD and I put it on and oh boy, is it one of the greatest movies I've ever seen. It's a very simple movie. Uh, <laughs> I don't, again, I don't like describing movies completely. You have to get the experience for yourself. But the basic plot of the movie is it's based on a true story. Uh, and it's about this this rich old fella uh, living, living alone. He's, his wife has passed. He's got real no friends. He's got all those uh, fake uh, acquaintances that all rich people sort of gather around one each other and go, ha ha, look at us. We're so rich. We're so wonderful. But they're not really friends. Anyway, he was in an accident and he's been paralyzed from the neck down. He cannot move. He cannot uh, look after himself in any way. So he needs somebody to look after him. Uh, and he pushes back against that a lot. He doesn't like the idea of being feeble and having someone have to wait on him hands and foot. And all the nurses that come and look after him, you know, it's always the, I believe in helping those who cannot help themselves. That sort of stuff that really demeans you and makes you feel uh, shitty. On the other side of this, you've got Omar Sy's character who is a, a very lower class, uh, street smart, uh, former criminal who cannot hold on to a job, uh, is trying to provide for his very large family who all have turned their backs on him because they don't think he's, he's, he's worth anything, uh, don't rely on him. And he isn't really trying that hard to change either. He goes through the parole rules that he has to try and apply for a job but he puts in the terrible interviews just so they'll sign his paper and say, yes, I tried for this job. You rejected me. You did. I did not try for it. Uh, I can get my dis my pension, my my disability, my uh, uh, whatever the word is for people who on uh, on the dole here in Australia, if you're more familiar with that. Anyway, he gets mixed up and he ends up uh, interviewing for the nurse position for this guy. Uh, obviously, he's not right for it. But the rich fella sort of sees him as uh, funny uh, and completely different to whatever he's had to deal with before. So partly to annoy his his aide and his nurse uh, and all the people around him, uh, he hires Omar Sy. Uh, and then what follows is kind of what you would expect from a heartwarming sort of film like this. Is Originally Omar Sy, he, he's annoyed he has to do it, but he he's begrudging. And then the way they both view life, rub off on each other, their complete clash in personalities somehow just gel perfectly together and they end up uh, becoming the absolute best friends who have each other's back, who come to each other's aid, who give them the, the, the harsh, tough reality when they need to, anything like that. But they, anything, their, whole, their lives change for the better. They become fast friends. Uh, Omar Sy helps out the rich fellow with his love life and and with his, 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 his new lease on life rather than giving up and hiding away in his tower. And the rich man in turn helps Omar Sy to appreciate his family, to be a better man for them, to uh, in, indulge in his interests and to make smart career choices in order to pursue his passion of painting apparently 
and become a better person after all. And then they have all sorts of fun stuff, like they go hang gliding together, uh, all the usual imagery that you'd probably see if you'd ever seen a poster of the Untouchables hanging up there. Uh, fantastic movie. It's, it's powerfully done by the actors in it. Again, I can't say their names because I'll screw it up. Um, there's a lot of gravity added to it as well because you know it's it's based on a true story. There's, every time you see a movie and you know that it's got... Uh, it's been influenced by something that happened in real life. It always adds a little bit more power to it. That's why I hate those movies that go, this is kind of based on a true story, except for the bits that aren't. It's like, shut up. I hate you, Adam Mackay. All your movies suck. Uh, but in this instance, when it's actually based on a true story and it's not being a dickhead about it, it's pretty great. Uh, it's, it's a very simple movie. Uh, the only thing that obviously people would have trouble Watching it, if I were to recommend it, is of course it's in French, so subtitles. And there's a lot of uh, confrontational, arguing, powerful scenes, so a lot of people speaking, a lot of subtitles flashing up. You can't put The Untouchables on as a background movie. It has to be a movie that you settle in, uh, sit down, and engage. Mainly, so you can read the subtitles and know what's going on. No matter how good a movie is, if it's in a different language and you're not paying attention, there's no way you can follow along, really. You can get the gist of what's happening, but it will not have the same impact as it would if they were speaking English and you were just hearing it in your ear while you were looking somewhere else. Uh, suffice it to say that The Untouchables is a fantastic 9 out of 10 movie. Uh, something that will definitely, if you're willing to give it a chance and read the subtitles and all of that shit, uh, will move you to tears to make you feel all sorts of emotions. Uh, it's truly a fantastic film. It's, it's one of the greats, for sure. It should be in my 1001 movies to watch before you die. It isn't, and I don't know why. Because Vice is in there, and that movie sucks. Fuck you, Adam Mackay. Uh, anyway, the point of this, though, is that if I recommended The Untouchables to you, and the only thing that would stop you from watching it is it's in French, then happy day, I could tell you to watch the American remake of it called The Upside starring Brian Cranston and Kevin Hart. Uh, now, I recently watched The Upside in preparation for this episode, so I didn't make that uh, monumentally arrogant stance and go, The Upside would be nothing on The Untouchables. The Americans don't know how to do it. It's a powerful film. It shouldn't be remade or whatever. Uh, because in my research for this, uh, some ways, that's the only way to get people to appreciate the story you're trying to tell in any capacity. And would you believe that a lot of my favorite films are actually remakes of movies that exist in other countries? For instance, The Birdcage, starring Robin Williams and Nathan Lane as that gay odd couple who have to pretend to be straight uh, when their son's daughter brings Gene Hackman over to visit, based on a French movie. Uh, the Departed, where Leonardo DiCaprio and Matt Damon uh, both trying to one-up each other in the undercover uh Police gangster world run by Jack Nicholson, based on a uh, on a French movie, a remake French movie. Uh, True Lies, where Arnold Schwarzenegger is as secretly a spy, and Jamie Lee Curtis is his unassuming wife who realizes what's going on, based on a on a on another country movie. Three Men and a Baby, even where Ted Danson and friends have to raise a baby, is based on a French movie. Uh, and that's not taking into the fact that Godzilla, for for all the Godzilla movies that exist here in America. They're all remakes of Godzilla that exists in Japanese. And there are people who are adamant Godzilla fans who have never seen a Japanese Godzilla movie because of that issue, because of that barrier between culture. It's not just the subtitles as well. It's the way that different countries uh, act and behave and have different approaches to things. There's a different vibe. And sometimes that vibe's not going to gel with you because you just don't understand that culture. That's not necessarily a good thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a thing that exists. Uh, you you would be forgiven for watching a Japanese movie and being like, I don't understand what that joke is implying. But if it's a Japanese culture thing, it's probably hilarious. And vice versa for things in America or Australia. Uh, just because everybody speaks English doesn't mean that English is going to be well translatable to a French speaking country or a German speaking country or anything like that. So, remakes exist so the world as, as a whole can appreciate this one story just told different ways. Uh, that being said though, sometimes a movie is more powerful in one particular culture or one particular way of telling it than another. Uh, so the upside is 
Beat for Beat, The Untouchables, really. Uh, has the same sort of opening. It's got the same storyline. Brian Cranston is the crippled rich man living in his penthouse who needs someone to look after him and he's, and he's depressed and he's pushing back. Kevin Hart is that uh, street smart uh, former criminal who, in this instance, uh, needs to provide for his ex-wife and son, uh, has no drive, has no real intention of improving himself. Brian Cranston hires Kevin Hart and they both change each other for the better. Uh, there are small differences, which I only know because I've watched the two movies side by side. Uh, apart from opening the exact same way, it deviates in a lot in terms of how their relationship is formed, mainly because of the difference between French, French and American culture. And there are uh, other instances as well, which changes are made maybe because of uh, uh, certain needs of that production. For instance, in the American version, Brian Cranston is paralyzed, but he can move his head. So whether that's because oh, it's Brian Cranston, he wants to move his head, so we'll move his head. Or maybe you get more emotion if you're able to move your head. Me personally, I think The Untouchables, where he physically can't move anything, uh, comes across as a lot more of a, a stronger character trait than that. Uh, also, little things as well. Kevin Hart, for me, he, it's hard for me to see him as this serious character. There's bits where he like threatens harm on people because he's like, I've been in prison. But you just remember Kevin Hart is the little guy standing next to Dwayne Johnson, so you don't feel that from him. That's the danger of being typecast in Hollywood, I would say. In the end, though, the upside, the intriguing thing about it, if I'd never seen The Untouchables, I think I would say The Upside is a pretty good movie and I would recommend it. Uh, because I've seen The Untouchables, I'd say it's a pretty good movie, but it's inferior to the source material and I wouldn't recommend it if you'd seen The Untouchables or I would recommend you see The Untouchables over this one. The Upside is a pretty solid movie that's forgettable. The Untouchables is a masterpiece which is interesting because it really is just the same story told two different ways. So how is it that one is more effective than the other? Does it come down to culture clashes? Does it come down to uh, tweaks in the story? Does it come down to the actor's portrayal? It really, it, it's an interesting topic that I don't think I can provide you with an answer for because it really comes down to one, whether you've seen one or both versions of the remake and whether you can, uh, your ability to appreciate uh, film media is limited to your country of origin or Western culture, or if you're able to adapt on a larger scale. Um, but at the same time, you shouldn't poo-poo this stuff. I am saying that I would recommend The Untouchables over The Upside, but I'm not saying that The Upside is a bad film because, oh, they should never have remade The Untouchables. I'm glad that there are people in the American world, in the Australian world, even people like my mother, uh, who just cannot watch The Untouchables because they just cannot get past the subtitles. The upside exists for them to get the story without all that hassle. And they'll never even know what they're missing because they can only watch the one thing. And the one thing is just good enough that it's still an entertaining movie. And then when you, if, if I were to open Pandora's box, I don't know how many movies that I love I would find out are actually remakes of other movies from other countries. It's a never ending list of sorts. So my final question I put out to everybody really is to have a think about their favorite movies, uh, have a think about where they came from, um, have a think about your approach to remakes in general. You may, up until listening to this, have been one of those people that's like, uh, it's the worst thing in the world is to remake a classic. You should never do it. Uh, uh, if they, a, they remake James Bond with a, with a new, new storyline and and whatever, reboot it, remake, all those different words. Uh, but at the same time, your favorite movie may secretly be a remake of a movie that came out in France 50 years ago. So there you go. It's just something to ponder. I know when I started this podcast in 2019, I was going to be like, these are things we'll be dissecting and going into a lot more. And since then, I have made so many episodes about the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Star Wars and... Uh, big high budget grossing movies uh, I've dropped the ball on this sort of stuff um, I cannot promise that I'll be able to write the ship uh, because it's more fun to talk about the newer stuff and I get more hits with that so <laughs> on a completely self-serving nature I'll just keep doing what I feel like doing and you hopefully will keep listening 
But overall, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed. I hope this has been an intriguing listen for you. I hope it's got your brain thinking about remakes in general, where your favorite movies come from, uh, how you see that, that culture difference between film, whether it's something you can overcome, whether it's not, whether the infamous subtitles really make or break your ability to watch a movie. They're, they're hard questions, which uh, I don't expect you to have the answer to. Uh, but go ahead and try anyway. So, as said, I will be back at some point to review Disenchanted. I don't know if it'll be towards the end of this week or at my usual time slot next week. Uh, but stick around because that will be my next episode whenever it comes out. When I say stick around, I mean keep an eye out for it. I don't expect you to sit around and wait. <laughs> we all have lives. Uh, but until then, uh, thank you all for listening. I love and appreciate you as always. It's been a treat. And if you can, and if you want to, give the untouch- untouchables, the intouchables, a watch, because I highly recommend it. And if you can't, check out the upside, because that's pretty good too. Uh, until next time, you've been spliced in later. Adios, muchachos. I'll catch you next time.